Good. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, maybe 10 million different species living on Earth. And uh, the first question that really intrigued me was trying to understand how so many interacting species could coexist with each other, how they could all persist. And I spent a lot of my life pursuing this question, so many other people. I want to just give you a quick summary of what sort of I would assert we have learned. First of all, this many, so many species interact and coexist with each other because there are many things that limit them. So there are multiple limiting factors. They live in habitats that are not the same from point to point, so they differ in space, they differ in time. And those two things, though, cannot explain diversity. They can't explain having many things coexist. If these two factors exist, if there are limiting factors and if there's heterogeneity, there can be many, many species coexisting if there's also one more thing, which are interspecific trade-offs. And trade-offs are really the theme of my talk today. Trade-offs imply that for an organism to get better at doing one thing, it has to become less good at doing something else. If there weren't such trade-offs, there would be the one best way of being a plant, and the one best way of being an herbivore, and the one best way of being a predator. And we know that's not the case. That's not what has happened in the last three billion years of evolution of life on Earth. In fact, there are trade-offs. And in my system, in the grasslands I've studied in uh, the central part of the United States, prairie grasslands, uh, these are the, the, um, the main trade-offs I've seen for our plants. Plants which are better at competing for limiting soil resources do so by allocating more of their biomass to roots and such structures, and they put out a lot less seeds, so they're not very good at dispersing. So the trade-off between the ability to disperse the new sites versus competing. There's a trade-off between being able to be a good competitor versus being resistant to uh, the things which are trying to eat you, to their diseases, their, uh, plant, the herbivores eat them for a plant, and so on. And there are trade-offs that have to do with seasonality and temperature. Plants which have a physiology that makes them grow best when it's cool and wet don't grow very well when it's hot and dry. And there are plants that have, uh, are very good at getting resources from uh, one depth of the soil but not very good at other depths and so on. There are lots of trade-offs that we've seen. Those are the major ones we've seen in our system. Um, and I'm going to sort of show you what these imply. So how many of you have seen a graph like that before? That's all? Well, I'm going to have to double how much tuition I charge you then to explain this to you. <laughs> so um, this actually was, I worked for my PhD on uh, competition between algae freshwater algae for limiting nutrients, diatoms. And uh, what I found was something that came out like this. So here's uh, one resource, let's say phosphorus, another resource, let's say silicon. Um, and here are two species. What I found out is when you look at how much of the two resources a given species requires, it, it's defined by an isocline like this. That shows how much resource it has to have to live. There's a corner of the isocline where it is equally limited by both resources. What I found is that these isoclines for different species of algae cross each other. And where they cross, there's a point where these two species can coexist, a stable equilibrium point. And they only cross if these isoclines, if these species have a trade-off. If to become better at living on one resource, like going from here to here, living on less of resource two, means they have to have uh, more of resource one a trade-off between competing for one or the other. But when there are such trade-offs, things can coexist. These ice lines cross to the point where they coexist, and there is a region of the environment, availabilities of resource one and two in this intermediate region that lead to stable coexistence of two species. Over here, one of them wins. Over here, the other wins. But in between, they can coexist. And it turns out, if you have a trade-off curve like this, such as each point in the curve could represent a unique species, that point right there, is the requirements here of species B for resource one and resource two. Here's the requirements of species A for resource one and resource two. But every point could be a unique species uh, on this curve. If, and if there is this trade-off, if getting better at using one resource makes you worse at using the other, which is what these points in here mean, uh, when you do the mathematics, what you find out is this. You can choose any point in this trade-off curve and that defines a species, and there will be an equilibrium point here where it can coexist with another species. And you could have even another third species come in here and have it coexist. 
here's a species up here. This species A coexists there with that species. These two coexist here. These two coexist here. And you can add line after line after a curve like this, these isoclines, one after another after another. And the logic that I want you to understand is that all those possible species, species that are defined by having their traits falling at some point on that trade-off curve, all of those species can coexist with each other when they compete if their habitat is heterogeneous in terms of the supplies of resource one and resource two. So to have two species coexist or many coexist, you have to have trade-offs. You can have more than two resources, you can have other limiting factors, but in all of the logic, all of the mathematics that has been done on interacting species, competing species and coexistence, you have to have trade-offs. Without trade-offs, things do not coexist. One wins and the other ones lose. So, um, I'm just a little bit of sort of explaining the logic I'm going to show you, the data that are relevant to it late, later on. So there's one more thing I want to show you. Um, and, and that is here is this trade-off curve T1 and it shows if species happen to fall in this trade-off curve, they will be coexisting with each other. What would happen if some species had a superior trade-off? If it could live at less resource than shown by this line, if it could survive down here where none of these can survive. These things only can survive if they have at least the amount of, tra of resource on their isocline. In here, none of these things can make it. Well, what if there were some species that were better than them? Some, something like um, shown here, this new trade-off curve and this new species X. They can live on less resource one and less resource two than any of these other species. So it's below this trade-off curve. Well, this thing would, would be able to grow to be able to grow in these leftover resources and invade and it would, in this case, it would get rid of, it would competitively displace that species and that species. It would still coexist with this one A and D, but if there was another species on this trade-off curve, another one down here, they would come in and with just a few species on this superior trade-off curve, they could exclude all of the other ones. So how do you think evolution of life happens? As new species arise, what do you think they do? Well, I thought what a new species would do would be better than other ones that were there and that new species would fall on, on a better trade-off curve. And so I thought the, the process of life as things evolved and new things came in and other ones went extinct, it probably meant this trade-off curve moved through evolutionary time from here down in this direction and the ones which came in were better and would displace other species. Does that seem to make sense? What evolution is, it should favor better traits, right? Well, I thought so, and, and it's not how nature seems to work. Um, but I'll show you that in a minute. Now, here's a real experiment. Uh, now, not for algae, but for vascular plants, long live perennial plants in the grasslands, uh, the tall grass prairies of the United States, the middle of the continent of the U.S., uh, nitrogen limited uh, systems. Uh, there can be high biomass and they can be limited by light. So, here are four species. These two live in the eastern part. Of, these, of the tall grass prairie where it is fairly wet and these live in the western part where it's fairly dry and you might imagine these are better competitors for water um, than, than these and here in the wetter area uh, the tall grass prairie is more nitrogen limited. So here shows you the requirements of these species for nitrate and for light and these are actually measured based upon monocultures planted along a soil gradient from nutrient poor to nutrient rich low biomass to low light. And these isoclines for these two species of grass, these two perennials, are, in, are inside of these, and these two should win. They can draw, these species can draw resources down to some point in their line, isocline, lower than the amount needed by these other two grasses. And these two should uh, win in competition over these. So Schizocarium and Panicum should competitively displace those, is the prediction of these, of these isoclines. Uh, and these two, because their lines cross, should coexist with each other. So we planted all four of these species in the same plots uh, and, and let them compete for 11 years with each other in the field. And we had multiple replicates of these on a, on, in, in, in various blocks in the field. Here's what happened. The two species which had the low isoclines and should be the best competitors of these four for uh, nitrate and light and whose isoclines cross and therefore should coexist, do coexist. And the other two species which had higher requirements are driven extinct, basically. They lose. This is a log scale. 
you can see this is they really are losing. They're being exponentially driven out of the system. So this sort of shows you these isoclines work. We've done lots of tests trying to find out how we can look at the resource requirements of species and do they predict what happens when they interact. And over and over our results show if you measure the resource requirements of species as summarizing these isoclines, they do in fact correctly predict what happens when these species compete with each other. And here these, the western species had higher requirements and they lose. Now let's look at what's, what's happened. So here's what's happened to land organisms. And this is the total number of families of land organisms on earth since the Ordovician when the land really started being colonized by multicellular organisms. And it shows you uh, that there's been this continual increase from basically no families of them to oh, 1,400 families uh, of uh, terrestrial uh, plants and animals. So there's been this massive diversification of life on Earth. Um, and this diversification is, is well known uh, to be associated with an organism entering a new habitat and then when, it, when an organism enters a new kind of habitat, they adapt to the habitat, and as they do that, they speciate. And for instance, the Proteaceae, uh, a flowering plant in South Africa, um, now has generated uh, 75 different genera and over 1,000 different species that has spread across that region and differentiated. And the same thing is true, for instance, in southern Mexico. Oh, it's something like about four or five million years ago, mountains popped up in an area that used to be a, a tropical rainforest that was wet all year because of the mountains was only wet half of the year. And uh, in the subsequent several million years, uh, a line of trees speciated that dropped their leaves as a way to live through the dry period of time. And there's this whole rapid burst of speciation. So we see new species forming in the fossil record when there's sort of new conditions that come into being. Uh, but we also see something else about, about it. Uh, so for instance, here is a diversification over that same period of time uh, in four-legged animals, which include birds, if you will. The wings are legs, if you think about this. Um, and from one progenitor right around the Ordovician until now, we now have 380 different families of, of, of quadruped animals with 23,000 different species. An interesting review of that process, a paper by Benton that came out in Science in 1996. He asked, what was the pattern of speciation as all of these 23,500 species of, uh, of, of, um, of uh, tetrapods came into being? And he found out that, they, that the original species would move into new kinds of habitats, they would exploit new kinds of resources, they would have a change in their diet in this new habitat, they become specialized on that new resource and that new habitat. They wouldn't go back, well, they wouldn't go back into the original habitat and displace anything. They would, in fact, coexist. They evolved to become different. There's a trade-off. They became better at one thing, but worse at something else. They couldn't outcompete their ancestors that were still living. They're the ones that gave rise to them. But they were good at doing something else, either in that same habitat or in a different habitat. And this pattern of diversification, where they became better at one thing, a bird is better at doing things which mammals can't do, if you want to take a really broad look at this. Uh, that trade-off seems to be with them coexist. And I think the most important insight of this is that they were, as, they, as these species new form, they were adapted to new conditions, but they, couldn't, they actually didn't perform very well at all. They were inferior in their, the original conditions with their, from which uh, their ancestors came. And so there was a, a gain and a loss. So although we often think about evolution as, as being a progressive process in which things become better and better, what I would assert is they simultaneously become worse and worse at other things as they become better at some things. And I'll show you why I assert that even more. And I would assert that clearly if you look at what's happened, how can we have 10 million species of organisms living on Earth now if when a new thing arose, it just competitively displays something that was inferior? On average, as we have new species coming into being, the only way we can go from one species uh, that was the progenitor of all land, uh, all the tetrapods, 380 million years ago, to having 23,000 species now, is on average, as a new species arose, it did not competitively displace an existing species. You can't go from one to 23,000 and have the new ones always outcompeting the old ones. So the question is, why does this not occur? Um, why do we have all this coexistence going on? 
Well, I want to first show you something that's not very deep in the fossil record, but it has to do with humans, and, uh, humans moving exotic species into new habitats. And as, as you know, some of the most sensitive habitats to exotic species seem to be islands. This is a, a paper that uh, Dove Sachs, Steve Gaines, and Jim Brown wrote where they looked at a, a series of about a 12 or so um, um, oceanic islands, islands that are far from mainland habitats, are very isolated. And they looked at the plants living in these islands. So for instance, here are the Hawaiian Islands. They had 1,223 described uh, species of plants on those islands, living on those islands. Uh, and of those, 71 species are now known to be extinct, the most extinct in, in any column here. But since that time, since European movement has brought plants into there, or another movement probably also, there have been 1,090 new species of plant that have invaded the Hawaiian Islands that are now naturalized, they're living in natural ecosystems on the island. They're not just planted in yards. These are actually out in the remaining natural habitats. And the total number of species you find when you go to the natural habitats still left in the Hawaiian Islands, 2,300 species. The diversity of the Hawaiian Islands has basically been doubled by these exotic plants. And there have been 71 things which have gone extinct. Um, that's the highest extinction here. If you look across these islands uh, in general, like here's New Zealand, 2,000 native plants, 2,000 invasives, 4,000 species, three things extinct. We see many, many plant species invading islands. We see diversity going up, these organisms coexisting with each other. Extinction is quite rare. In fact, on average across all of these different islands that they had data on, diversity doubled in response to movement of organisms, but on average only 3% of the existing species have gone extinct. Now when I saw the, this result, I thought it was very interesting, but I knew why it was wrong. Like, I'm sure, do you know why it's wrong? Well, I, my, I was sure they, it was wrong because they couldn't, they, this has not been very long. And it'll just take longer for the, for the uh, uh, exotic plants to spread across these islands and cause more extinctions. So to try to test that hypothesis, I looked at the fossil record. And so this is just sort of funny. I didn't have any training in, in paleontology, but I read lots and lots of papers. And, and um, I kept finding things which really surprised me. Because as I told you, I was sure I knew why that result was wrong. And I, I was sure when I looked at the fossil record, I would prove that they were wrong, that in fact, in the fossil record, the coexistence wouldn't be so certain. Uh, so uh, this is something which happened, again, 450 million years ago. North America, in the center, used to have a very large, shallow sea, a saltwater sea. And this is looking at the organisms that live uh, on the bottom of the sea, in this large, shallow sea. And because it's where North America is, North American paleontologists can go out across the landscape, across the, the states of the, of the middle, middle part of the country, and find fossil beds. And they can look at what was living in those beds at various times in the past. And this, this study by Potaski and Holland looked at what happened a million years before there was a big invasion, during the invasion, and a million years after this invasion of these of these um, marine benthic organisms, things like arthropods and mollusks and so on, brachiopods that came in to that habitat. And what they saw was there were, uh, 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 after the number of species that came in increased, the total number of invertebrates living on the, in the marine uh, bottom, 50%. So a 50% increase in diversity happened because of this invasion of, of new species coming in from the, from the Pacific Ocean. And there were no extinctions that happened. Everything they found a million years before, they still found during the invasion and a million years after the invasion. So there's a million years of coexistence. And they said when they looked at the, at the, at the, new, the new communities that had been created by this large invasion, they said they looked just like a, nat a natural community in their mind should look. They couldn't tell that, that, that some species were invaders. The invaders weren't unusually abundant. They weren't unusually rare. They were sort of sprinkled across the whole distribution of abundances uh, compared to what was there before. There are a few sites that invaders got into and took over those sites. But they had, they had something like 70 or so sites across uh, this whole old sea. So a few sites the invaders did very well in. Some sites weren't invaded at all. But on average across that whole sea, 
Nothing was driven extinct by invasion. In fact, all these things coexisted. Um, the re some relatively recent papers looking at the most diverse area of uh, the Amazonian rainforest, which is the Amazonian rainforest in Peru, uh, in the mountains in Peru. Uh, and they looked at the plants that were there. And don't forget, Africa and South America were joined together 100 million years ago, and they broke apart, South America drifting off to the west. Uh, so they share a deep common origin to their tropical rainforest, evolutionary origin, but there's been lots of differentiation and speciation since then. What they were surprised to find was that um, across this history, 20% of all the rainforest trees in this most diverse part of the Amazon were trans-Atlantic Ocean migrants of trees in the, in the recent past, the last 10 million years, from Africa. And they had no evidence of that. that so these African trees are able to invade. They have no evidence that they actually drove anything extinct. Now, the fossil record, when you go, go back that deep, is pretty messy. But it's at least consistent with this idea. And there's been lots of, of, of successful invasions of, of things uh, from, the Af from Africa into that region. Um, if we look at mammals, there's a wonderful book written by Flannery uh, on uh, the paleontology of the Americas from the uh, event 65 million years ago, the, at, at the boundary between the Cretaceous and the tertiary geologic epochs, when the meteor impact caused dinosaurs to go extinct. So this is after dinosaurs, immediately after that. He wrote this fabulous book of what happened, how the plants and animals uh, evolved in uh, North America and South America, where they moved from, and so on. And uh, Looking at mammals, he said something like, uh, what is, I have the wave, uh, his, his little statement here, that basically you would have expected that as there's a wave of new migrant animals coming from Asia into North America, that it would have caused some extinctions. But he said they never caused extinctions. Wave after wave, when the land bridges would form, there'd be massive movement of, of mammals from Asia to North America, from North America to Asia, and time after time, they coexist. And they coexist for millions and millions of years. Uh, in fact, if you remember what North America used to be like just 10,000 years ago, it had a large mammal fauna more diverse than you see in the Serengeti of Africa today, which were driven extinct when humans invaded North America, which are sort of the one organism that won't follow my talk today. So again, coexistence was the norm of these invasions. My favorite study of all these is, is one by Gary Vermey, uh, who looked at a, uh, an invasion of the mollusks of the North Atlantic Ocean that happened when water levels changed and those from the North Pacific were able to come in. When they came in, the North Atlantic only had about 30 species of mollusks. The North Pacific had something like 270 species. Of the 270 in the North Pacific, 200 of them moved into the North Atlantic. So you had 30 ex existing native species of mollusks, 200 other species coming in and invading. And there were no detectable extinctions. Let me put it, he actually, he did a more careful study than just saying that. He actually looked at the long-term rate of extinction in the North Atlantic before 200 species invaded and after 200 species invaded. And the extinction rate was not different before or after, but slightly lower after 200 more species came in than it had been before. Basically, these things coexisted. And he said, although biotic interchange may have many important consequences for the species in a, for the species in a recipient bi uh, biota, extinction is an unlikely consequence. He said for marine biotas, but it's also unlikely for plants, terrestrial plants, unlikely for mammals, unlikely for birds, all the things in the fossil record that have been studied, when these big migrations happen, the organisms coexist. They coexist for millions and millions of years. So, the question is, how is it that coexistence has in fact been the norm, the rule that has happened as organisms speciated, they coexisted with, their, with other organisms. When they moved into new continents, they coexisted. Why is coexistence the norm of life on Earth? What does it mean? What do we learn when we find out that with almost no meaningful exceptions, when you look across all the organisms that have been studied, coexistence is the norm. Organisms, despite coming from different continents, despite having separate evolutionary histories, coexist. But what I sh tried to quickly show you at the beginning is the logic of coexistence says organisms can only coexist 
communities of organisms can only coexist if they all share the same underlying quantitative trade-off. If some organism can be better at two or three things than everything else, it will increase in abundance, it will displace them, and there will be extinctions caused by that. They have to all fall in the same trade-off curve. I'm not going to go through the mathematics of it. I had a paper in the American Naturalist a couple years ago where I took these data, I asked for 14 major interchange events between uh, continents, between realms. I asked how long was it from after the interchange event occurred until the first extinction was observed. Uh, and, and I think the number, the shortest number was a million years, many were 10 or more million years. And I said, if it takes that long for something to be displaced by another competitor, if that was the cause, and there's no evidence it was competitive displacement when the extinction occurred, how different would trade-off curves be? And the, and the, the, the largest possible differences between trade-off curves, if they're not identical, the published in that paper was five one-hundredths of one percent, which would be two lines on the graph I showed you that you couldn't tell apart. They'd literally be visually exactly on top of each other. If I graphed them that little apart, you could never tell the difference. So what it says is that if there are any differences in these trade-off curves, if organisms really are evolving not just to be different at different points on a trade-off curve, but actually evolving to be better in an absolute sense, where they can live on less resources and less uh, uh, combined across all of the limiting factors, and actually, if they could actually push that trade-off curve to a lower level, what this says is that millions of years of, of separate evolutionary history it never led to that curve being pushed more than five one-hundredths of one percent. Uh, which is an undetectably small amount. So, I thought the world worked like this. I thought when exotic plants from another realm came in, in fact, I wrote a paper, a wonderfully wrong paper that came out in the journal uh, Ecology um, in uh, 1999, where I, I had a graph, in fact, this graph, saying that here will be organisms from one continent, here will be them from another continent. When the other continent invades, if that other continent was larger, and had a longer period of time for evolution to occur, they should have evolved to have a better trade-off curve, and when they invade, they should cause extinction. I was so sure it happened, I wrote this in this paper, everybody read it, published it, liked it, I believed it, they believed it, I found this data, it's totally wrong. I've been wrong my whole career. Uh, <laughs> but maybe I've been interesting, I don't know, but I've been definitely wrong many, many times. That's one of the ones I was wrong. Um, there just, this doesn't seem to happen. This is what I thought should happen. This is what I thought my simple interpretation of evolution would lead to happen. That organisms would actually evolve to be absolutely better in some absolute sense. What I see now in the fossil record, what I see in the invasions of modern habitats, uh, the work of uh, Sachs, uh, Gaines, and Brown, isn't consistent with that. It says or life seems to be bound to the same trade-off curve, no matter what. No matter what the phylogenetic origin of those organisms are whether it's cactus, cactaceae in the new world invading the old world as cactaceae competing against, um, oh, what are the, um, I'm now drawing a blank, the cactus-like plants of the old world. You don't know either, okay, that's good. What? Euphorb, euphorbiaceae, the euphorbs. Uh, whether it's the cactus against the euphorbs or one kind of mammal against another kind of mammal, it doesn't matter, they all coexist. So. What I would assert this suggests is the hypothesis that life for a long period of time has been bound to a universal trade-off surface. That organisms cannot exceed, They're, they've been evolutionary and capable of exceeding it. Uh, and that what, what the process of evolution is, is basically movement on that trade-off surface. Becoming better at one thing but worse at something else. And that what we call these very high diversity ecosystems that we see now are just places where a lot of this trade-off surface has now been covered by the process of speciation. Now, I would assert that that only seems logically possible, plausible, for there to be this universal trade-off curve that all of life is bound to if one thing is, is so. Let's think about this. We had three and a half billion years ago, 3.6, whatever it is, single-celled organisms competing with each other. And the shakeout, what was the long-term outcome of all those interactions among those organisms? Well, the long-term outcome was a single eukaryotic cell that became all the multicellular animals. And that, said, that happened, what, 
600 million years ago, something like that. So there's two or so, two and a half billion years of evolution of the, all, of the underlying molecular physiology, the molecular biology of life. The genetic systems, the, the whole, all of the uh, biochemistry that all of us share in common with every other organism on Earth was perfected over billions of years. And I would assert at the time that that eukaryotic cell became the progenitor of all animals on Earth, or different when it became the progenitor of all plants on Earth, that that underlying physiology had been perfected by natural selection for such an incredibly long period of time that it was highly unlikely that any uh, deviation from that would lead to something that was absolutely better. It could be different. Uh, an algal cell became a redwood tree, given enough time, right? That, that's what evolution did. Uh, but algae can double uh, in biomass once a day or twice a day. Redwood trees are once every hundred years or so. There's a pretty big cost. A trade-off, you're better at one thing, worse at something else. And I would assert that it is that cost, that when you allocate some of your cells to do one function, you can't use them for another function. When you take a single cell and put more of your amino acids into making proteins on the cell surface to take up more of one limiting nutrient, you can't use those same amino acids to make a different protein to take up some other nutrient, a cost. You do one thing, you do less of something else. And that because of this uniform, uh, uh, refined physiology, molecular biology physiology that all cells share from that time 650 million years ago till now, what the only thing that was left for life to do was to have trade-offs, to be, give up something by gaining something else because they weren't going to change their, under, their fundamental biology at a deeper level. So I want to now talk about what this biodiversity that did evolve on Earth, what it does. I've told you that the that the logic behind why the world has so many species is that organisms are forced by being bound to this trade-off curve to become specialized, to become better at doing one thing but worse at something else. That's what being bound to a trade-off curve implies. Now it's probably not a simple curve like that, it's probably a multi-dimensional surface. I only can think in two dimensions, three if I'm lucky, not in 10 or 20 like nature probably really works in. And the mathematics of that is complex and I can't even imagine it. But the people I do know who imagine it say strange things happen in multiple dimensions. Um, but I want to talk about these multiple dimensions um, and ask about not just why there are so many species, but what those species do. But remember that what I would assert is a trait of a species. The trait is a specialist on some point on some trade-off surface. And the issue is what happens when you have many, many points on the trade-off surface, surface covered. How does that influence how ecosystems operate? Well, here's um, one of the great naturalists, Charles Elton. Uh, so Darwin, Elton, and others were uh, great naturalists. And uh, at the time of Elton, no one did experiments. Almost no one did mathematics. Uh, but they observed nature. And now we do experiments in mathematics. We don't, not that many of us spend our time observing and seeing patterns in nature. And I think, these are, I think this is a very important trait that isn't as common in our discipline as it really could and should be. Because in his observing of nature, going around looking at different kinds of ecosystems, he wrote this fabulous book in 1958, The Ecology of Invasions by Animals and Plants. And he had fabulous ideas in the book, which became sort of the stuff of textbooks in ecology. Um, three hours, isn't it? Um, he basically said that more diverse systems should be more stable, they should be less susceptible to invasion, they should have less disease. Interesting ideas uh, that um, were, as you know, fashionable uh, in his time in the textbooks when I was a student. And then uh, Bob May's book came out uh, on diversity and stability in model ecosystems, seem, suggesting that seemed to be highly unlikely mathematically. There were no experiments. There were no quantitative replicated attempts at, at uh, observation in nature. So everybody forgot those ideas and no one thought about biodiversity for a while. Uh, and so there's about a 20 year period where it was sort of out of favor. And we had this experiment running in, in our grasslands. Uh, a drought hit the experiment. And in the, in the experiment, we saw something which we published in Nature. I actually knew this result four years earlier. I didn't believe it. I couldn't understand how it happened, so I thought it must be an artifact. So I didn't publish it, and I kept thinking about it, thinking about it, thinking about it. And I finally did so many analyses along with a colleague of mine, John Downing, we could find no way to reject this hypothesis. We had to publish it, and then we took a lot of flack. If you 
Some of you who are older know uh, some of the names I was called. Uh, deluded because of my love of nature by wanting diversity to matter, even though it clearly didn't. Oh, the, there were fun things said. Um, so here are plots that had low plant species numbers in them. When this drought hit, their biomass fell to about one-tenth of what it had been before the drought. Whereas the plots that had high plant species in them, high diversity, uh, had the uh, biomass only fall to about half of what it had been before the drought. So there seemed to be this effect of the number of plant species on how uh, stable these ecosystems were, how able they were to resist this major once in a 50 year drought. Um, which the same drought basically eliminated all corn yields and soybean yields and so on for farmers unless they were irrigating them. So a very major drought. This paper came out um, and because I knew I didn't really, I had to show these results. I didn't really know why they're happening. I put out some ideas. But I also am the kind of person who really trusts experiments. So actually the year before this paper was published, we set up this experiment. We got it, got it ready. We planted it in the spring of 1994. It was a biodiversity experiment. Uh, it has um, uh, 152 plots, 9 by 9 meters apiece, that are planted with one species or two or four or eight or 16 different plant species. So they're all long-lived perennial plants, the dominant plants of the Great Plains of the prairies here. And each plot was a separate random choice of which species would be planted there. That means we could average across all the monocultures and say, how do these species perform on average if there's only one of them? Or what happens if we have two? But we have all these different combinations. We had about 35 replicates of each of these levels of diversity, 30 to 35 replicates. So with that, we're able to average across which species were present and ask, does it matter how many are present? Does diversity matter? And here's what we see, for instance, this is a while later. This is now, um, we planted it in 94. Here is at 2010, 2012. Here is each of the species in monoculture. This is all replicates of each species average. So you can see here is how that species performs and other ones and so on up to this. Here are all the two species combinations, the four, the eights, and the sixteens. And this is how much above ground biomass is produced in a year, in a growing season. It's annual net primary productivity. And if you compare, oops, um, the typical monoculture plot on average across all these monocultures with the typical 16 species plot, we have more than 200% greater productivity. The typical 16 species plot, a high diversity plot, is three times the biomass of that, 100 grams up to 300 some grams. Three times more biomass. It's a huge effect, larger than we ever imagined would have, ever, would have happened. We had no idea it would be like this. And if you look, here's a single best species growing in monoculture, right there. And that's how productive it is. Every single high diversity plot was more productive than the single best species. And on average, these high diversity plots were 65 or so percent more productive than the single best species. So if you were to want to harvest the most biomass off a field, maybe biofuel biomass or, or hay or whatever it might be, you could plant something in monoculture or you could plant it with 15 other species and get an awful lot greater return, a lot more yield. Partly this happens because in more diverse plots with more roots at different depths in the soil and so on, there's greater uptake of the main limiting nutrient nitrate. And I seem to have lost an axis here, but that, this is, oops, this is soil nitrate concentration. Um, so that's, that was our main initial hypothesis, that more diverse plots would be able to exploit the limiting resources more effectively through the soil depth and through the seasonality, and therefore be more productive. Um, we also saw, as Elton has suggested, that more diverse plots were harder for other, for exotic plants to invade. So this is the biomass of invading species. This is a log scale. It fell by about a factor of 10 going from monoculture to high diversity plots. A lot fewer species are able to invade, a lot less biomass of the invaders coming into these plots at high diversity than at low, and fewer species, 15 species on average invaded monocultures, only five invaded the 16 species plots. So there were one-third the number of species, and the, and the species that were there were one-tenth the abundance, just as Elton had said he had seen. And when he tried to find what variable explained this, the single best variable at explaining the difficulty of plants invading high diversity plots, was those high diversity plots had a lot lower concentration of the main limiting resource, nitrate. 
An invader has to be able to survive on and grow on whatever is left, unconsumed by the established species. Invaders live on leftovers. Right? They have to be able to complete their life cycle on whatever is left over by uh, whatever resources are unconsumed, left over by the established species. And because these high diversity systems drive resources to lower levels, it's much harder for invaders to come in and grow and survive. Uh, disease incidence also falls off. These are fungal diseases on the leaves of these plants. Disease falls off very rapidly with diversity. At high, high diversity, um, there's just much, much, much lower incidences of all the diseases we've looked at. Um, there's an effect of community structure. We planted these plots with randomly chosen compositions. And uh, because of that, these are different functional groups, cool season grasses, warm season grasses, grasses, legumes, and non-legume forbs. And this is asking what is the effect of the planted plants, planted function, the, the total biomass of all the plants in each of these functional groups, and how does that affect the abundance of, of invaders? In this case, we added invaders as seed into little subplots and asked how well they did. And the non-legume forbs had their only significant impact of all the invaders who added seeds on other non-legume forbs, and it was a negative impact. So forbs mainly inhibited forbs. C3 grasses only inhibited significantly other C3 grasses. C4 grasses inhibited everything. They're a dominant sort of matrix forming thing. And I, I'm not going to claim those two numbers are different, but slightly higher if you want to stretch it. And legumes had no significant effect on anything else, and their only even negative effect was on other legumes. So across these, all these studies, the four biggest numbers in each of these rows are of something on its own group. So there's a real structure to how these organisms interact, and they differ uh, in this way. And we can actually blow this up and look at how they affect soil nitrate concentration, soil moisture, and so on. And you can see these other axes of what's going on there. But this is part of the big story. These communities really are structured. There's a strong competition. And things that are more similar, they compete with more strongly. Um, now, you can go from these experiments to mathematics. And we've done lots of mathematics asking, looking at the mechanisms, the trade-offs that can explain coexistence forming mathematical theories, solving them, and asking what do those models predict. Um, and I'm going to just quickly show you one summary, and I'll show you all the math. Here's a, a summary of, of what four different models they all have. They all share the same uh, prediction. They all predict that the whole community will have greater and greater productivity as diversity increases. They also predict that the whole community will be more stable as diversity increases. They predict that individual species, as there's more diversity, will have be lower in abundance, of course. There are more competitors present, and there are lower abundance. But the sum of all the species is greater. They predict that the stability of individual species, where did this go here, of individual species will decline, but the sum of them will be greater. So the whole system is more stable, even though each species tends to be more variable. It sounds contradictory, but it's totally logically consistent mathematically. So these are the predictions. They're very similar to what we observed. I want to quickly just mention a couple other things we've seen. One, we didn't start out to look at the whole food chain, but we happen to have with us some of you who really knew the insects. And so we know what is happening to the abundance of all the insects, the predators' abundances. We've had uh, over a thousand different species of insects we found in our plots. We've counted them and so on. And this is a ratio of the predators and parasitoids divided by the number of herbivores. And what you can see is this ratio is low, meaning in low diversity plots, these are dominated by herbivorous insects. And as you go toward higher and higher diversity, the herbivores are becoming less abundant and the predators and parasitoids more abundant. So why are diverse plots more productive? Well, there's less disease, there's more resource use, but also they have a top-down effect of predators and parasitoids keeping the herbivorous insects at low abundance. This is a very important food chain effect. We don't know why that happens. I've not seen an explanation why plant diversity should affect this ratio of predators to herbivores, but it does happen. A very interesting effect. Well, let me see. Is that There we go. Uh, something else that happened. Uh, this is what has happened through time in this experiment. So this is the yield, the biomass being produced above ground versus diversity. Here it curves early on in the experiment, 95, 97, and so on, up to 2000. Uh, 9 or 12 or whenever it was, each curve for a year, and the curves are coming steeper and steeper and steeper in uh, 
one biodiversity experiment and another one. These are right next to each other. This one also includes CO2 addition and nitrogen. And Peter Rice has been the lead investigator on this, so one of my great colleagues. And if you look at this, the slope right here measures what's the effect of losing a species uh, from 16, let's say, to 15. Uh, early on in the experiment, it wasn't much an effect. Up here, the, the slope right there is as steep as it was down here for losing a few losing species from uh, from three to two. In the first years of the experiment, is now how steep it is there. So the effect of each species gaining or losing a species has become greater and greater and greater through time in this experiment. So diversity, if you if you look at it, the measure of the importance of diversity is actually greater the longer this experiment has run. And as these experiments run longer, they're much more like real ecosystems in nature. The prairies have been in North America for tens of thousands of years. And uh, when you set up a, a, a planting of prairie plants and follow them for two or three years, you're seeing that ecosystem in its infancy. Now this is 20 years later, and we're seeing that the effects of diversity are incredibly strong compared to what we estimated early on. They're becoming stronger and stronger through time. So I, I want to uh, summarize what I've, what I've told you today. So, um, I've asserted that the pattern of diversification we've seen on Earth has occurred because clearly the Earth is a very heterogeneous place, but especially because there have been these unavoidable trade-offs uh, that organisms have faced during diversification, and that the outcome of these trade-offs is that diversification is not a process of things becoming in some absolute sense better, but becoming better at one thing at the same time they unavoidably become worse at one or more other things trade-offs. I've asserted these same kind of trade-offs. In mathematical theories, you add these trade-offs to those mathematical theories with trade-offs in them predict greater productivity at greater diversity, greater stability at greater diversity. They predict greater resistance to invasion, less disease. So the same kind of processes that, and the same kind of patterns that you, that you expect to come out of the pattern of evolution are the processes and patterns of interactions among species that make diversity matter, that make diversity have a very large effect. In fact, I want to, I to skip to a few slides here. I'll just show you this is how important is diversity. This shows the effect of, of having a system fall from 16 plant species to one and how, what the change in biomass is at our research site. This is the effect of having it go from 16 species to two, from 16 to four, from a diverse site to less diverse. Here's the effect of adding about as much nitrogen as corn farmers, maize farmers add in the United States. The less nitrogen and less. Here's the effect of adding water. Here's the effect of drought, imposing a drought. Here's the effect of adding CO2. Here's the effect of fencing out herbivores. Here's the effect of a stopping fire. The effect of diversity of all these variables is as large or larger than all the things that we thought 20 years ago were the big forces controlling grasslands. Nitrogen, water, drought, CO2, we didn't think maybe it was so big, we thought it was there. Herbivory, herbivory and fire. All major forces that control how ecosystems function. And none of them have a bigger effect than biological diversity. I'd love to hear your questions. Thank you.